you, Dr. Leili Anvar, to deliver her second poem tonight with a more specific title of The Quest of Majnun, The Tribulations of a Lover. Thank you very much. I, um, so I, yesterday I talked about the, the th about thirst and the quest for water and the word talab as being um, one of the words that uh, I have translated uh, as desire in English. Um, today we're going to talk about another word and that word is ishq, which is very, uh, again, a very difficult word to translate, even though very naturally we translate it love. But I must tell you before I start this lecture that ev uh, each time I will say love, I will not mean just love in English. I will mean ishq. Sometimes uh, we should maybe not translate, we should just put ishq, because ishq is much more than love. It's a desiring love. It's, it's a passionate love. It's something that, that comes upon you and never lets you go. Uh, Esh comes from a root, an Arabic root, that means that, that uh, also has given the word to um, ashara, which is the plant that goes up the roofs, you know, and up the walls and just keeps on the, <laughs> keeps on the wall and uh, never lets its victim or go. So the, really, and in, in the um, love treatises in Arabic, this word is almost never used before it became very fashionable in Persian poetry. Esh really in the, in the Arabic treatises is considered as, as a terrible thing to happen to someone, that happens to someone, and it's really passionate love. And then the Persian poets decided that this was the word they wanted to use to talk about that particular feeling of love, desire, passion, that is actually impossible to quench in a way. So that's it. I wanted just to warn you that today we're going to talk about Esh and the hero of Esh in Persian and also Arabic literature actually is Majnun, uh, of whom I'm going to talk tonight. Um, and Majnun, of course, is the name under which that hero of love became famous. But in the beginning, as we shall see, he was not called that way. Majnun, nobody today in the Middle East or anywhere else is called Majnun. Many women are called Leili or Leila. The, the Arabic uh, origin, original is Leila. Leila. And, uh, but nobody's called Majnun, of course, because Majnun means literally possessed by the jinns. And you understand why. Majnun is the asher par excellence, you know, the, the lover. And the lover, uh, the absolute, the, quintesc the quintessence of love lovers, is, of course, someone who is possessed by the jinns, the demons. And I must also add before we get into the stories and the, the poems themselves, I must also add that the word jinn is used many times in the Quran, particularly when um, condemning the poets, because the poets are also majnun, they are possessed by the jinns. And majnun in the story, in the, from the beginning, in the legend of majnun, from, is from the beginning a poet. So Majnun means possessed by the genes in two, mean, in two meanings. First, possessed by love, passionate love. And second, or I don't know which one is first, which one is second. Uh, he, it means both possessed by love and possessed by the, the, the demon of poetry. Love and poetry have something in common. They are demoniac. But then we'll see that it's... a. Uh, fantastic demon that everybody should develop in, its, in himself or herself. The romance of Leilio Majnun is the romance of desire in every, sense of, in every sense of the word. Desire as passion, desire never satisfied in the visible world, as you have just said it. 
This is not only true of Nezami's or Jami's works that have the same title. So I will have to just to tell you all the time to tell you Leili on Majnoun by Nezami, Leili on Majnoun by Jami, because they bear the same title, the two long poems written by those two authors. But also, uh, so this is not only true of Nezami and Jami's poems, but also of its source of inspiration itself, the Arabian tale of old, and of the stories innumerable and um, of the stories innumerable versions in Arabic, Persian, Turkish, Urdu, Bengali, Hindi, even Georgian, etc., etc. I think there is no lang language in the Islamic world and beyond, because Georgian are not Georgia is not an Islamic is not part of the Islamic land. There is no really no language anyway of this in this culture that has not in some way or another produced a poem or poems related to Majnun. The Majnun Leila legend, which is the primary uh, in Arabic uh, uh, legend written in Arabic, goes back to the first century of the Islamic era, seventh, eighth century, and the original name of Majnun was in this tradition Qais ibn Mulawah from the Banu Amir tribe. He loved a woman, tells the story, called Leila, and he loved her madly. And because he was a poet, he expressed his love for Leila in lyric poems in which the beloved's beauty is celebrated in a multiplicity of images that became the unsurpassable mod model of all lyric poetry ever after. The story was told in the form of a legend by Abu Abul Faraj al Isfahani. Uh, of course, he's called Isfahani, but he wrote in Arabic which was quite common in those days. So he was a Persian, but he wrote in, in um, Arabic a very important book called Ketab al aghani in which we, you have all the legends of all the first poets and lovers of the Arabic tradition. It's Ketab al aghani means the book of lyric songs, and he wrote that in the 10th century. This book was probably the main source of Nizami when he composed his version in the so in the 12th century, and also of Jami, who composed his own version in the 15th century. Even though the latter, that is Jami, was, I think, much more inspired by Nezami than by the Arabic version. Jami actually recognizes his debt to um, Nezami and also to Amir Khosro Dehlavi, who had composed, uh, who also composed his own version of Lelio Majnun. Um, and uh, in the, so he, does, he recognizes his debt in the introduction to his uh, Masnavi, and by choosing the same meter than Nezami, namely Hajaz e Musaddas. That's just to say that we know what the meter is. What Jami, <laughs> what Jami's version as a mystic comic, actually, we, what Jami adds to the version by Nezami is very precious to us because we can read Jami's version as a mystic commentary of Nezami. Indeed, if Nezami already spiritualizes the theme, which is apparently not so much spiritual in Arabic poetry, the story and the, and the, um, the story as he tells it remains rather enigmatic as to the to what Nezami meant by writing it. And as you know, there is a great controversy as to know if Nezami was a mystical poet or not. And as I told you yesterday, I think this is not the question. When you are a poet, you're necessarily mystical in the, per in the Persian <laughs> culture. And if you're a mystic, you're necessarily a poet. This doesn't mean that you're a religious writer. When I say mystic, I don't mean religious. I mean someone who has, to, who has the, the urge to deal with the invisible. That's the only thing I need, the only thing I mean by the word mystic. So if Nezami already spiritualizes, and I will show how the theme, in fact, Jami is the one who will really give a close commentary as a spiritual master, he will give a commentary of the story of Leilio Majnun as being the model of mystical love and how the soul should um, seek for its uh, spiritual or divine beloved in this world, in this world that is compared to a desert, and we'll see why. 
as I tried to show yesterday, uh, so we will see that there is a continuity between profane themes and mystical themes in um, when in in, on, in when this theme of uh, Majnun is uh, uh, expressed through, through uh, Persian poetry. So what is briefly summarized, the story of Majnun? As I told you, Majnun was, uh, so he was um, a poet in a tribe, in an Arab tribe, and he fell in love with Leila while uh, taking care of the camels. That's in the, in, in the original tale, he's taking care, they are taking together to, care of the camels. And he falls in love with her, but he loses Leila, so in the Arabic version she's called Leila, because he expresses his love for her and describes her beauty in poems without concealing her name. You had the right to compose lyric love poetry in which you describe the beauty of your beloved, but you never had to pronounce her name. Doing that was a crime of honor, was considered a crime of honor among the Arabs. It was like unveiling the woman. It was like raping her in public. And it is so strong that by so doing, he loses the possibility to be united to Leila forever. This is called in Arabic the crime of tashbib. So, and it's really considered a very, very serious crime. That, uh, it, and even, uh, it's so, so much a crime that um, Leila's father would be allowed to kill him for that. As I told you, it's like raping her. And here comes this idea that naming her is the problem giving her name in a poem means making her alive exactly in the way I talked about yesterday. Poetry makes things more real than reality. That's why it's, it's a crime to do that, to talk about her beauty. And um, so, in, um, sorry. <laughs> Later, um, after some tribulations, uh, when uh, Majnun gains the right to marry Leila because he has waged war against her tribe and he has been victorious in this war, uh, Leila's um, father tells to one of Majnun's friends, I would prefer to kill my daughter, give her to dogs to be eaten, rather than to give her to someone who unveiled her beauty in poetry. This is just to tell you how strong that question of poetry is, and was for the Arabs already. And of course, this idea was um, assimilated by Nizami. In lyric poetry, in Persian or Arabic, the mere, al the mere allusion to the names of Majnun or Leili or Leila, as I said, immediately evokes radical and maddening desire. In short, among all the numerous hero lovers of Islamic literature, Majnun has become the archetype of the lover and Leili the archetype of the beloved. In a passage of Salomon and Absal, Jami uh, relates the following scene. It's not in his Leili Majnun, but it's an evocation of Leili Majnun in Salomon and Absal. He says in Persian, Did Majnun ra yeki sahra navard dar miyane badiye benshiste, dar miyane badiye benshiste bekhard. Karde safhe rigo angoshtan qalam. Mizanat, pardon, mizanat ba ashk khunin in raqam. Gofte in Majnun shayda, chi istin? Minevisi name, bahre ki istin? گفت گفت عشق یاد لیلی می کنم خاطر خود را تسلی می کنم اکسکیوز می گفت مشق یاد لیلی می کنم خاطر خود را تسلی می کنم چون میسر نیست من را کام او عشق بازی می کنم با نام او 
A man crossing the desert saw Majnun seated alone in the middle of that barren land. And as if his fingers were a qalam on the sand, he wrote words with his hand. The man said, Hark, my poor madman, what is that? Are you writing a letter? But for whom? Whatever pain you take in writing this, the winds and storms will erase it soon. Majnun answered, I tell the beauty of Laili, I solace my own soul by so doing. I write her name in the first and last place. I write a letter of love and constancy. Of her, I have nothing in my hands but her name. From it, my humbleness acquired great fame. Not having drunk even a draught from her cup, now I make love to her name. And I think the whole story of Lelio Majnun um, reproduces that, making love to the name of Lely. And we will have many, many little stories and anecdotes in which Majnun either writes her name or tells her name or just says Lely, 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 Lely because he cannot do anything else than just repeating her name. So it's very important the fact that their names are mingled and that he, he's, in the end, he, he just becomes the poet of Lely. That's why, by the way, in Arabic, he's called, uh, the, he, we always say Majnun Leila. It means the one who is mad of love with Leila. It's, it's, it's a compound. In Persian, Nezami preferred to put the name of Leili first and to transform Leila into Leili, which is a Persianized version of Leila, and to put her name for, first and say Leili or Majnun because, uh, as we know, Nezami uh, considers that women has, have to be... Um, at the center of all his um, po or his romances, his poetic romances. Indeed, any desire is an unquenched thirst, the result of absence and or frustration. So I could not drink from the cup of Lely, so I make li love to her name. What Majnun does in his desert by writing the name of Lely, by composing poem after poem on her beauty, by gazing at the musk deer and ravens that remind him of her, or by breathing the perfume of the beloved, is to fill the gap of absence and distance, to transmute emptiness into fusion of essences. Nezami introduces the theme of hollowness at various levels of his work. The poem deals with an ever-growing rarefaction of, rarefaction of space, time, human relationships, so as to better serve the violence of desire, but also to penetrate into the very essence of things and to a higher reality. Indeed, Nezami has conceived his work as a reflection of the trajectory of desiring love, a movement towards nothingness, that is the condition of the advent of perfect love. It is important to note that Nezami has commissioned, uh, was commissioned to write his Lady Omajnun by a local prince. In the beginning, he had no, he, he, he was not inspired by the story. It was just, you know, a, the command of the king of the prince of Shirvan. And actually, in the introductory, in the prologue of, the, of his Lady Omajnun, he complains of the difficulty of, uh, to compose a poem dealing with such a brief plot that takes place in a desert, he insists on the fact that it's a desert, with no occasion, he says, to describe royal feasts and beautiful gardens. And you know that the natural setting of Persian poetry is the garden. And he says it very precisely there. How can I write a poem if I have no garden to describe? How, how is it possible? But then it was the command of the prince, so he had to do it. And uh, he, uh, he says, for example, Dehliz fesane chon bovat tang gardat sokhan az shod amadan lang. Meidan sokhan farakh bayad ta tab savari nemayad. And this, oh, in, in English, sorry, when the field of the tale is narrow, then the speech that should come becomes lame. Although this story is a famous one, it allows no description of verdant bliss. Uh, so, you know, is also, you know, it's, it's a very 
special way of putting things. That means he, he, if you want to go on horse, running on your horse in, in the field of, of uh, poetry, well, you need to have some space, and that space is the possibility to describe gardens. But the horse reminds us, of course, of the steed of, um, evoked by Rudecki in the first poem that I commented upon yesterday. He goes on, Nezami, on complaining that the story as well as the setting of the story are so dry. He uses the words dry, desert, you know, uh, waterless, etc. cetera, uh, that uh, they have actually never insp inspired any poet before him. And actually there was no Masnavi, that is long versified romance about this story before. He also evokes the nudity of the story the better to glorify, of course, his own poetic powers. Ba in hame tangi masafat, anjash resanam az letafat, kas khandan u be hazrat shah, rizad gohar nasufte bar rah. Khanandash, khanandash, agar khanandash gar fesorde bashad, ashiq shava dar namorde bashad. Mi goftam u dil jawab midad, kharidam u chashm ab midad. دخلی که ز عقل درج کردم در زیور او به خرج کردم whatever the narrowness of the field i shall raise it to such delicate beauty that when read to the king it will spread perfect pearls pearls at his feet even depressed any reader of it will fall in love and he, he, if he's not a dead man i spoke and the heart answered i dug and the source provided water the pearls I obtained from reason, I used them for its ornamentation. In short, although the theme did not immediately inspire him, and though he was only obedient to the prince, apparently, he decided to turn a painful story set in the barren lands of Arabia into a source, literally a source, he says, Cheshme, of inspiration. The decisive theme of the romance is love, but love considered as unquenched desire and paralleled to the process of inspiration. It is something that you don't have, and you have to go for it in the desert. The, metaf the metaphor of water standing here for inspiration is often used by, the mover by all the actors in the romance as the metaphor of love. The lovers themselves are often compared to plants, and Leili speaks of Majnun as her khezr, guiding her in the darkness of the water of life. Khezr, of which you have here a representation, means literally, uh, literally the, um, the green one, the, the greenish one, uh, and it is a legendary prophet that has not been named in the Quran, but by the, uh, then the, the, the stories of the prophets have, give, have given him a name. And this prophet is said to have guided and initiated Moses, and also he is the guardian of the water of life. For example, uh, we find in, in the mouth of Leili, Leili says to Majnun, O oh, you the source of Khazr in darkness, you moth of the morning candle. And a few lines later, verdant is your hand and you wear the robe of Khazr, be in accordance with me like the water of Khazr. And this is a very important theme because Khazr is in the Zolamot, in the obscurity, and uh, everybody is looking for this water of life, this Abe Hayat, and he's the guardian of it. And he's the one who can judge if you can drink, if you ever can find him in the obscurity of Zolamat, uh, he's the one who judges if he can give you that water and make you verdant again, make you green again. Uh, I will not insist on this today, but in comparative literature, it's very interesting to compare this theme in Persian literature to the theme of, that we call in medieval European poetry, the theme of reverdi, re, uh, re, Regreen, I don't know how to say it in English, but reverdi is a style in the, medi in the medieval poems. And it's, it has all to do with this, because in the reverdi you have the, the cycle of uh, spring coming back, but the cycle of spring coming back is all, always connected to love, 
to the experience of love that becomes the water which makes the world uh, green again when spring comes. But this is something else. But it would be quite, quite interesting to study that. Uh, I just tell you to say that that water of life, the idea that desire, love, and water are, are connected metaphorically, is not specific to this, uh, to Nezami or to Persian poetry. But of course, uh, it's, um, it's something that is rather universal. Majnun. Uh, so you see that here in this image that Khezr is standing on a fish like in, a, in an ocean, precisely because he's an aquatic character. He's the one who, uh, who reigns over the waters of life. And at the same time, he holds a globe in his hands because it is an allusion to the Persian belief that the world is a globe that is on, on uh, the horns of, um, of a Taurus, and that Taurus is uh, standing on a fish. And very often, when you say, in Persian poets say, as mahi tamah, from fish to moon, it means the whole world, because it's considered that the whole world is standing, actually, on a fish. And this means that, uh, in a way, Khezr uh, is, is expanded into, into cosmic dimensions. And it explains to us that when Leili says to Majnun, you are my Khezr, or Majnun says to Leili, you are my Khezr, because there is a reciprocity in this love, it means that not only that you are the one who guides me in the obscurity of this world, but also the one who embodies the whole cosmic powers that make uh, the world uh, turn and be uh, return turn and return to spring every year. I will not insist on this, but it, it's a theme in itself. Actually, uh, because Khezr is also the guide, the spiritual guide, we can see in that image that. Um, that the search for love and the search for inspiration appear as an initiation to a higher wisdom, to a specific kind of knowledge that can in turn be transmitted through the words of poetry. Any reader, says Nezami, any reader of it will fall in love, as I quoted before. Let us remark in passing that desiring love is evoked without object as a pure state of being in itself, a sign of the living soul in the reader of Nezami's poetry. He says, everybody who is in love, he doesn't say in love with what. He says just you have to be in the state of being in love. As, we, as Rumi hinted to that, we, we talked about it yesterday. Jami, as for him, in the prologue of his chapter called Dar Ma'ni Eshq Sadiqan Va Sidq Aashiqan. So um, the chap, it means, um, concerning the, the love of the sincere ones and the sincerity of the lovers. He says, Chon sop e azal ze eshq dam zad, eshq atash e shok dar qalam zad. When the dawn of azal whispered, love put the fire of desire in the qalam. The qalam of God, of course, in, with which he writes the universe, creates you the universe, but also the qalam of the poet, qalam, is both the qalam of God and the qalam of the poet, which makes of both of them creators, of course. And actually, this, this um, parallel between poetry and the qalam of God, which also wrote the Quran in the pre-eternity, the azal, the time of pre-eternity, is no wonder uh, in, in, um, in, under the qalam of Jami, because Jami is the, pers is, is the one who gave the expression Quran in Persian uh, when he tried to define the Masnavi of Rumi. So, you know, he's, he, he parallels the function of po the poet with the function of a prophet. And he was, he was a very good Muslim. He, he had no problem with that, I just say, <laughs> in, in case, just in case. Um, so, um, and the same Jami says, uh, about the circumstances of the comp composition of the roma romance, he says, let's have his words. Ooh. 
read in Persian, but which line? <laughs> yes. سرمایه مرهمی ز عشق است. بل کادمی آدمی ز عشق است. هر کس که نه عاشق نه عاشق آدمی نیست. شایش شایسته بزم محرمی نیست. So he considers that um, you cannot, you are not a human being if you're deprived of love. And if you want to know what uh, love, the, the intimacy of love is, you need to experience love and then you will become a real human being. جز عشق مگوی هیچ و مشنو حرفی که نه عشق از آن خموش شو So don't say anything except speak about when you speak about love and don't hear anything neither. Any word that is not about love is not worth saying it, so be silent. If you, are not, if you have nothing else to say, then if you, have something, if you want to say something else than love, it's better to be silent. And he says that as a poet to say that actually if you, if you want to compose poetry, you absolutely need to speak about love. The two are completely connected. And he adds that he wrote before Leili Majnun the story of Joseph and Zuleikha, Joseph and Zuleikha. And he says this was a source of grace. Again, he uses the word Cheshme, it was a source of grace, but my thirst was not quenched. So the poet is also someone who's thirsty. He's thirsty of his own words explaining what love is. But my thirst was not quenched, so I w and I wanted more. So I turned to the story of Leili Omajanun. And this is the ultimate story, of course. In the following, <coughs> so another parallel between Majnun's situation and that of the narrator concerns the background the narrator I would say the narrators, Jami and Nezami, concerns the background that provides such importance to the image of water. Nezami insists on the fact that the story in itself is so to speak barren, as we said, and that he needed to dig in order to find water in it. As I, as I quoted it before, This is really interesting to, to explain the uh, process of uh, inspiration. As to Majnun, it is necessarily in the desert that he can dig his own heart and achieve both perfect love and perfect poetry. The pearl, is, the pearl image strengthens this idea because pearls belong to the imagery of water. In the treatises of gemology in the medieval period, it is said of the pearls that they are a sublime transmutation of a drop of water into a jewel. So dor, which is the metaphor of, for poetry, is very often, is, is considered in the medieval times as a quintessence of water. Nezami has adept, adopted actually the main elements of the legend and particularly the desert elements, recalling its great moments, although with some personal choices and developments, which I will not I will not um, um, develop today all of, the, all of these differences, but some of them are important to uh, hint at. For example, the displacement from the pastoral setting of the Arab tale, you know, they were keeping the camels together, um, has been transformed by uh, Nezami into a maktab, where Majnun experiences, Majnun and Leili, experience love at first sight. And again, it's very important that it's reciprocal. He falls in love with her, she falls in love with him. And you have a description of Leili's beauty and of Majnun's beauty, which is, by the way, not, um, not so important in the Arab tale. Uh, in, in, Maj in Nezami, from the beginning, it's reciprocal, and it happens in the Maktab. So if there are any historians of the 12th century, I would be quite interested if they could tell me what that means. Does it mean that in Nezami's time, girls and boys went to school together to learn Arabic and to learn to read the Quran? He doesn't say that it is something so extraordinary. He puts it as if it was something quite normal. But this is just a question I ask to historians because I have never found the answer to this question. 
Anyway, uh, Nezami needed Leili Majnun to meet in the Maktab because he needed to show that their experience of love is also an experience of a higher knowledge than that which you um, achieve or you, you can collect in books. And that is why he uses a series of anaphors that are quite interesting uh, to, um, to, to, to read in detail. He says um, in Persian, So they are in the school, they, they have fallen in love. And that's how he describes the difference between these two and their friends who are in the maktab with them. Yaran be hesab elm khani vishan be hadith mehrbani. Yaran sefat maqal goftand ishan hame hasb hal goftand. Yaran varaqi ze elm khandand ishan nafasi be ishq randand. یاران ز شمار بیش بودند ایشان به شمار خیش بودند اکسکیوز می یاران ز شمار بیش بودند ایشان به شمار خیش بودند Their friends were there to learn and study while they would learn the tale of tenderness Their friends built a language made of words while they were writing with words beyond words their friends celebrated the greatness of language while they spoke the language of love and the heart. Their friends studied sciences out of books while they breathed only the air of love. Their friends learned to count ever more while they only recounted their love. Um, and in this image, one of the very, very, of the numerous images that represent this scene in actually all the, the, the Khamse of Nizami has been very often illustrated. And in, uh, when um, you look into the manuscripts of Lady Omajnu and the illustrated manuscripts, you have systematically the illustration of this scene because the readers or the illustrators considered that this scene was really very important. That's what it means. And what do you see in this scene? I just show you one of those miniatures. Yeah, I could have shown many others. Is that um, you can see at the center, almost under the mehrab, you can see Leili. In front of her, you have Majnun. And as you may uh, notice, they're not looking into their books. The others are looking somewhere else. They're looking into their books, they're looking to each other, etc. They don't look where they should look. And what is the direction in which they should look? It's the direction of the mehrab. Maybe you have noticed that Leili is under the mihrab. And what is the mihrab in a mosque? It is the um, architectural detail that shows the direction of the Kaaba, of the Me Mecca, and shows the direction um, for, the, for the ritual prayer. So when you, when you want to, to pray to God, you have to... Um, to, to know the direction to which you, you must pray, and the mehrab shows you the direction. And um, Nezami notes, when describing the beauty of Leili, she was the mehrab for the prayer of the idol worshippers. She was the lamp of the house and the candle of the garden. And this illustration is a is a um, commentary through images of this particular verse. And it's uh, particularly important because it shows that Leili is actually a lamp exactly as God is considered Nuru Samavat Mar Az in the Quran. The God, the God, God is said to be the light of heaven and earth. And he is the lamp of the universe. And when he says Leili was the lamp, Leili was the mehrab, he means that she is literally a theophany, that is, a light of God incarnated in a, in a human being, here in a woman. And many times you have the beloved represented in a mehrab as a sovereign and uh, incarnation of light. And indeed, usually the mehrab is 
decorated with that verse, by, in that Quranic verse, Allahu nur God is the light of uh, the earth and the sky. So it is this detail shows us that Nizami is telling us more than just a love story, just an ordinary love story. The fact that he uses the word mehrab to say, to define Leili, means that already Nizami was spiritualizing the theme. Um, Jami also compares, compares very often uh, the beauty of Leili to, uh, with um, religious terms, in religious terms, or particularly in terms that remind us of the Kaaba itself. Not only what is she the mehrab, but her dark hair is compared to the um, dark, the, the black curtain that is around the Kaaba, and the ho her whole body becomes the Kaaba around which uh, Majnun does his circumambulations. So this is very, very um, odd uh, under the qalam of such a theologian as um, Jami, but he, was, he had no problem in doing this in his poem. For example, uh, Jami says, when he saw, when Majnun saw from afar the black, co the black color of the curtains of the veils of Mecca, his eyes were dazzled by the splendor Jamal of the Kaaba. He remembered the beauty Jamal of Flady, and the burning of desire made him, uh, made him shout, made him shout. When a poet shouts, usually that means that he is producing some very um, uh, noisy poetry. And in a way, Majnun's poetry is very noisy in the sense that it's very violent. Even the Arabic poems attributed to that Majnun are very, have, have something very violent about them. But it's important to see that when he sees the curtain, it reminds him of Leili. And uh, in, uh, in other places, when he sees Leili, it reminds him of the curtain of the Kaaba. So, you know, they're closely connected in the same way as she is the Mehrab, that is, she shows to the direction of Mecca. Her person shows, to, shows the direction of unicity. She's an idol that is a sign of the religion of unicity, which is against idol, idolatry, idolatry. But they have to, Majnun cannot, Majnun, that is every human soul, cannot understand what unicity is, cannot have access to the jalal, the splendor of God, without uh, the... Um, the mediation of Jamal, beauty. So that is how transcendence and immanence work together in this poetry. Although Jami does not deviate from the original sto story told by the Kitab al-Aghani, that is, he doesn't speak about the Maktab or anything like that, um, from reading both works, we get the feeling that the story per se does not s is not so much important as what the descriptions of the variations of love tell us about the experience of love. The, both stories have a rhapsodic structure, uh, and that is why they are rather loose as far as structure is concerned, giving the impression of successive lyric uh, moments that, you know, that follow, in a way, the structure of the desert itself. As you know, you know the desert is not a town, so you, you just have nothing to hold to. You have nothing to show you the direction. So you have to go through that desert, even poetically, by not having a, you know, a story that is built as Nizami can build them. You know, we know that the mastery of Nizami, when he wants to build a story, he can do it. It's not because he couldn't do it that he didn't do it. It's because he felt that his imagery, his, the structure of this story had to follow the, 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 this uh, no man's land that the desert is, in a way. So they designed, both of them, their masnavis, as great lyrics that follow the structure of the desert. The reader wanders in the love story, sometimes relaxed by the evocation of the garden, because he does that, of course. Nizami cannot refrain from describing gardens, although these are always, you know, a description of gardens in the desert, you know, 
oasis or something like that with palm trees, for example. You know, you don't have cypresses, but you have palm trees instead. So sometimes we're relaxed by the evocation of a garden, sometimes roused to emotional climax by the poetic evocation of love. Although there are a few warlike episodes, as I told you before, we may argue that the poem basically only contains three types of action, falling in love, burning with desire, and dying. You understand why in Islam he found it very difficult to make, a po to make poetry out of that. And this does not only concern the main characters, in various degrees it's also true of Majnun's parents and of Ibn Salam, uh, the person, oh sorry, I forgot to show you that beloved in, in her mehrab, this is a very, very beautiful miniature. Um, so I'll tell you. I, I come to that later. So this is also true of, Majnun, of Majnun's parents and of Ibn Salam, Layli's husband, because Layli is married by force to another man so that the, the father can make sure that she will never be able to marry Majnun. The best way to, to impeach a woman to marry a man is to marry her to another man. That's called forced marriage. Um, so in various degrees, Majnun's parents, who are in love with her, their son, his aunt, uh, his uncle, Ibn Salam, and many other characters in the, in the um, story, are, re represent also one aspect of love. But these, uh, these lovers act very little or not at all. Their main characteristic is that they long for someone, for someone or something they cannot possess. Majnun's parents want him to return to reason, to life, to them, and they die in their frustrated desire. Ibn Salam literally, literally both poet tells us, dries up. He dries up. And he dies because Layli refuses any sexual intercourse with him. Uh, she even slaps him when he tries to approach. Initiated to supreme love and sublime poetry, but incapable of rising to Majnun's degree in the path of love, the other lovers return to the civilized world, taking with them Majnun's words. And in the end, because they, cannot, they don't know what to do with this, these words, because, as Nezami puts it in the beginning of the story, they are already dead to love. They think they love, but their desire is not right. So they are already dead. So they listen to the words of Majnun, but it makes absolutely no effect on them. And they dry up and they die. Leili herself mostly does nothing, nothing but cry. Hidden in her tent, she also prays and sometimes sends letters. But that's all. And she explains her inaction by the fact that she is a woman. Actually, a, a social reading of this poem has led some... Uh, experts to consider that Leili is the model of the Muslim woman who can do nothing and who is so weak. But you, I think you're by, this time, by, by now you have understood that I totally disagree with that because she is, of course, a, theof a theophany. So she's not going to do anything else than just be a theophany. But strangely enough, Majnun himself doesn't act either to obtain Leili. And that reminds us of the character in the end of the Masnavi that I referred to yesterday, the one who doesn't act, had it all. And when he wages war, afterwards he regrets to have done this. He says, I shouldn't have done this, because it's, it's not through action that you obtain what you have to obtain. So in a way, he's a passive character. Moulavi would say, kahel. It is his father who asks for, for the hand of Leili without result and who takes him to Mecca to cure him from his love. It is his friend Nofal that wages war against the tribe of Leili to obtain her. Chop, chapter of the chapter, he increasingly dis, uh, disincarnates and the desert becomes a symbol of his absence from himself. And he's completely disconnected with the human world. Um, from the beginning, both Jami and Nezami tell us that his flesh and blood are made of love. Why? 
because Nezami invents a story, very interesting story, that is not in the, in the Arabic version. Uh, he says that actually the parents of Majnun could not have a child, were childless. And they prayed to God for years to give them a son. In the end, God gave them that son who had all the perfections. He was so handsome and he was a poet and he was so and so and so and everybody loved him, particularly his wet nurse, his wet nurse who, Nezami says, milked him with the milk of love. So his, his, even his bodily constitution is made of love. And um, Jami doesn't, doesn't adopt this version by Nezami, but he says, nevertheless, anyone whose clay is made of love, like Majnun, and who bears that word on the tablet of his destiny cannot erase it from his heart, even if, he's, if he spends his life washing the tablet. And actually, there is a very famous episode in which Majnun's fathers take him to Mecca to ask God to cure him. Against, again, we have this idea that love is an illness of which one has to be cured. Of course, one has to be cured if one is uh, a normal human being that wants to live in this, la in this world. We will see that. Of course, Majnun is no ordinary human being who wants to live in this world. So when his father takes him to Mecca, this is the illustration of it, um, when he sees, again, the curtain of the black veil of uh, the Kaaba, it reminds him of Leili, and, he's and instead of asking God to cure him, that is what he says. They tell me, Guyand ke khuz ishq wa kon leili talabi ze dil raha kon sorry Majnun cho hadis ishq beshnid avval begerist pas bekhandid az jay cho mar halqe barjast dar halqe zurf ka'b zad dast mi goft gerefte halqe dar bar ke imruz manam cho halqe bar dar در حلقه عشق جان فروشم بی حلقه او مباد گوشم گویند ز عشق کن جدایی این نیست طریق آشنایی من قوت ز عشق میپذیرم گر میرد عشق من نمیرم پرورده عشق شد سرشتم بی عشق مباد سرنوشتم آن دل که بود ز عشق خالی سیلا به غمش براد حالی یارب This is very famous یا رب به خدایی خداییت وانگه به کمال پادشاییت که از عشق به قایتی رسانم کوما ندگر چه من نمانم که از چشمه عشق ده مرا نور این سرمه مکن ز چشم من, ز چشم من دور گرچه ز شراب عشق مستم آشق تر از این کنم که هستم گویند که خوز عشق وا کن لیلی طلبی ز دل رها کن یا رب even those who don't know Persian have noticed that he constantly repeats Leili, Leili, Leili Talabi. He makes compounds with this name. And to, to, to translate it briefly, so when he sees the Kaaba, he, he, he takes the, 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 uh, the ring of the, of the, that is on the curtain and he, asks, he makes this prayer, prayer to God. They tell me to cut myself from love, but this is not what is done in an intimate relationship. My nourishment is love, nothing else. If love in me died, how would I not die? My whole nature was cultivated by love. I wish not my destiny without love. The heart that is void of love, for sure, the torrent of pain will take it away. O oh God, I beseech you, by the divinity of your divinity, by the perfection of your royalty, make me achieve such excess in love that I pass away, let remain love. Give me light, this is to be noted, give me light from the source of love. Again, that name, that word, Cheshme, source of love. And of course, in Cheshme, you have Chashm, I, that's why after he says, do not keep this call, this call, you say that in English, this call uh, from my eyes, because call is supposed to give light to your eyes. You know. 
And of course, there, there is always a play with oxymorons here. You have all the time black and darkness and light. The coal is black, but it gives light to your eyes. The Kaaba, the curtain of the Kaaba is, the veil of the Kaaba is uh, black, but it gives, um, but it provides the, 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 the light of uh, love in, in um, Majnun's heart. So you have al always that play between darkness and uh, light, between day and night, which is actually something that is suggested even by the names. Oh, by the name, by the name at, at least by the name of Leili, because her name Leili means the nightly one, the one who is related to the night. And of course, Majnun doesn't mean the uh, the daylight one, but actually, we always represent Majnun in his desert, burnt by the sun. So it's very um, important to understand that there are echoing each other as being one a solar character and the other uh, a, a nightly character in a way. So you see here an image of Majnun. He's, all, he's very often represented a little tanned. Well, this is the idea of the miniaturist of someone who is tanned by the sun. Uh, but you know, he has, he's not, uh, his hair is not cut. I mean, his hair is just um, disheveled and he's well, he's not totally naked, but almost, and he's always in the desert. But of course, the miniaturists are like Nezami. Even when they paint a desert, they need to put some vegetation in it, <laughs> although it is, in the, it is a theme, uh, desert theme here. And he's surrounded, of course, by wild animals, which is also another uh, topic that is uh, connected to Majnun. And Nezami tells us that in the desert, he's in connection with the animals, because he has um, dominated his own self, his, the animals inside him. That is why he can live with animals without being scared at all. And the animals will not attack him because of that. Um, so, after this event in the Kaaba, uh, when Majnun says, oh Lord, make me every instant feel even more desire of Leili's face, they tell me to stop Leili Talabi, which is a compound invented by Nezami. Leili Talabi, uh, precisely you have in Leili Talabi the word Talab that we, 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 we evoked yesterday, and you have Leili, Leili Talabi means the, the desiring of Leili. Though they tell me to stop this desiring of Leili, but I cannot do that because it's, it's in my essence to be that. And he adds, oh Lord, make me every instant feel even more desire for her face. He doesn't say for her, he says for her face. And we all know that again, everything passes away except his face. This is also a Quranic verse. And what is important is the face and the beauty of the beloved is always expressed um, in words that describe the beauty of the face, and the face itself becomes a source of light. After that event, of course, you can imagine that Majnun's father realizes that his son is beyond any cure, and that he will, well, he's definitely mad, and nothing can be done for him. That, that Nezami says that. He says, well, he was desperate. He knew that nothing was to be done. At this point, we know that, of course, when you become a Majnun, nothing indeed is to be done. Um, so maybe I'll show you some other desert images. I forgot to do it after, before that. This one is less tanned, but you know, it's the, really the same imagery with the rocks, the typical rocks of Persian miniatures, uh, in which you can, um, if you look closely, you can see that there are demons in the rocks which remind us of the uh, demonic character of, uh, of madness. Because Majnun means mad. Huh? So someone who is mad is considered possessed by the demons. Um, so in this desert, what does Majnun do? Actually, he, the only thing he does is to compose poems. Sometimes he saves certain animals 
from a, from a hunter, for example, particularly Ghazal, um, Ghazale, uh, so deers, you say deers for Ghazale, um, or who or Ghazale, because they remind him of Leili. And it's very, it's, it's, um, Nezami and Jami both, in a way, make a reversal of the function of metaphor. Usually, you say, Leili was beautiful like a deer, she was like, a, her hair was like a raven, uh, or like the night, etc. So you do metaphors or comparisons to tell the beauty of the beloved in term of cosmic beauty or of animals or things like that. Strangely enough, what Nezami and Jami do is that they show us Majnun holding deers into his arms, speaking to the raven, speaking to the night, as if they became the presence, the, the really flesh and blood presence of the uh, beloved in his desert. And as if the images we use to describe the beauty actually became real, as if it, wa it was not the beloved that was compared to, that, to those things, but those things that are the signs of the beloved. So they really change things. It's a way of telling us that poetry does that, makes it real, makes what we consider maybe like just an image, makes it become real. And the other thing that he does in his desert, except making love to the metaphors of Leili, is to pronounce her name. Uh, for example, Nezami says, apart from the name of Leili, he would listen to no word. If someone talked to him of something else, he did not listen or answered. Well, I don't know exactly who someone may, might be in the desert, but that's how he puts it. Or in Jami, he says, um, and this is a beautiful passage. Jami says about this um, Leili Gui. He speaks even of Leili Gui, saying Leili all the time. Um, he says, Leili naqsho delam neginast, Leili tokhmo delam zaminast, Leili janast o man tanura, u tuti o del neshiman uras. Ta tan jan ra bovad neshiman, man basham o Leili, Leili o man. So again, you hear it, even if you don't know Persian, you can hear that there is a kind of obsessive repetition of the word, of the name. Gashtam yek sar hame jahan ra, didam yek yek jahanian ra, هر چیز که روی در خلل داشت چون در نگریستم بدل داشت الا لیلی که گر نیابد که گر, نی... که گر نیاید چیزی دگرش بدل نشاید بر بی بدل ار بدر گزینم جز در دل و دین خلل نبینم Here I would like to insist on the fact that of course he says لیلی 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 and then he adds uh, sorry, the translation is, Leili is the form and my heart is the gem. Leili is the grain and I am the earth. Leili is the soul, John, and I am the body for her. She is the parrot. The parrot is the, the, um, the, the metaphor of poetry, of the poet, the parrot in, in Persian literature. She is the parrot and my heart, and she's the parrot of my, uh, sorry, she's the parrot and my heart where she stands. As long as the soul is within the body, there will be me and Leili, Leili and me. I have looked everywhere in the world. I have seen all its inhabitants, but all that which had all that which had a weakness, I saw that it could be replaced, except for Leili, Ella Leili, whom nothing can replace. This again is very strange under the pen of a theologian of of, of someone who was a spiritual master and also a very respected theologian, because it sounds like la ilaha illallah. You have these sonorities of leili, illa leili, that reminds us of that, that formula in Arabic that, that means there is no God but God. So when he says, I have seen that everything had weakness, illa leili, it means that everything was part of multiplicity and the weaknesses of multiplicity, illa leili, which becomes again a form of the divinity. And this is expressed through only through the sonorities. 
that's what I want to explain tonight, is that the poet, just by using Leili, Illa, Leili, he, he creates a kind of iham, a kind of allusion to the, um, to the religious formulation of unicity, la ilaha illallah, Leili, Leili, Illa, Leili. Well, you know, it's, well, kind of some, somehow heretical, but that's how it is. Um, so I will just maybe jump this. Because I <clears throat> want to not to miss the essential point. At a certain point, when Majnun encounters Leili, he tells her that it is not, uh, although he always repeats the name of Leili, although he wants to really focus on her and on nothing else, at a certain point, when he encounters Leili in real, in flesh and blood, he tells her that in the end of the day, that is not, it is not her that he loves. He's really mad, isn't he? But he loves the love of her. چون عشق تو در من استوار است با صورت تو مرا چه کار است شرک است مرا شریک با تو با عشق مرا حریف یا تو چون عشق تو روی می نماید گر روی تو قایب است شاید and this is of course this saves the story of الا لیلی and لیلی being a form of the divine etc from precisely from the crime of idolatry. Here, he says, so firm is my longing for you, what need do I have of the form of you? So she becomes a transcendent thing, you know, a kind of immaterial being. To have you in my, to have you in my love is crime of association. Either love is my man or you. When your love shows its face, absence best becomes your face. It is noteworthy that the concept of Majnun not being in love with Leili in the end, but with the idea of the idea of love, or even with, the, with love itself, simply with love itself, has been part of the legend as attested by another Arab um, author, Ibn Tulun, he, who says, Majnun's beloved came one day to see him. She found him crying, Leila, Leila, Leila and on his feverish bosom he threw snow that melted immediately. I don't know where the snow came from in the desert, but. Qais, she said, it is me, Qais, she said, it is me, Leila. Then looking at her, he said, go away. I'm all busy with your, with, with, uh, your, with the love of you. You are, you're in the way. In Jami's version, this episode becomes a surrealistic allegory really beautiful, we should make an animation of it, is the episode in which Majnun becomes a tree. At some point, he encounters Leili when she's on her way for a journey, and she asks him to wait for her until he returns, she returns from her journey. So Majnun say, stays immobile, exactly on the spot where she's told him to stay, and he starts growing roots, and he becomes a tree, and the birds make their nests and lay eggs, shining like pearls, in his entangled black hair. Just imagine, nobody has never illustrated this, and it's a pity. Um, and Jami says, در حیرت عشق آن دلارای بنشست درخت وار از پای. He sat like a tree from, from his feet or from his roots. می بود ستاده چون درختی مرغان به سرش نشسته لختی. یک جا چو درخت پاش محکم مو رفته چو شاخه هاش در هم. اهدی چو گذشت در میانه مرغی به سرش گرفت خانه. مویش چو بطان مشک برقع مشک برقع از گوهر بیزه شد مرسع برخاست ز بیزه ها به پرواز مرغان سرود عشق پرداز um, and after so he becomes a tree you have all those 
fantastic birds coming out of, uh, flying from his um, head or from his branches, I don't know how to say it. And then um, Leili comes back and she says, oh you who has adopted the religion, the religion of fidelity, she cried, look at me, the one to, for whom you have faithfully waited here. He answered, who are you? And whence are you coming from? Why do you come to me in vain? She said, I am your soul's desire, the wish of your heart and the power of your mind. That is, I am Lei Li, who has made you drunk, Lei Li, from who, whom you're waiting here. She also repeats her own name, trying to remind him of his love. He said, go away for the love of you today has burnt me with a world burning fire. It has taken away from my eyes the dust of form. It has taken away from my eyes the dust of form. I will no more be prey to forms. My love has driven me on the ocean of blood. There is no more lover or beloved left. And this is of course um, a very important theme in all the, the literature that is connected to what we call the religion of love in Sufism or in spiritual Islam in general. The idea that lover and beloved are concepts for the beginning of the path. In the end of the path, lover and beloved should disappear and only love remains, having absorbed all personality, all forms, all, in a way, all desire. But that is, of course, the end of the journey. So Majnun's love for Leili is avowedly not a desire of possession, not a desire of Leili as a woman of flesh and blood. It is a quest of love for love's sake, the desire to experiment that longing, that ishq, as a radical emotion that burns and destroys any other feeling, emotion, or attachment. This kind of love requires the negation of all other things. That is why the only possible setting for Majnun's wandering life is indeed the barren desert of Najd, from away from all human beings. The central role of images as incarnations is, in, is perceptible in Nizami's own poetic technique. In the same way as Leili is the living image of love that triggers Majnun's madness and brings him to, takes him to beyond Leili, um, so, in the same way as Leili is the living image of love that triggers Majnun madness, the musk deer, the night, the moon become the living images of Leili, feeling, so to speak, the gap of her absence. And in turn, that is exactly the role assigned to similes and metaphors, both in Majnun's poetry and in Nezami and Jami's works. The progress of Majnun is definitely a progress towards nothingness, to which his, his ascetic attitude and appearance, here he's really ascetic because it's an Indian miniature, to which his uh, uh, ascetic attitude and appearance contribute in a visual manner. That's why it's, it's, the theme has been so often illustrated. The fact that he doesn't eat or sleep anymore is a sign of the process of annihilation. Time and again, we are reminded that for Majnun, Ishq is an initiation to self-annihilation, which brings actually a great paradox because it's self-annihilation in which poetry still remains. And poetry, as Rumi says, is also always a, sane, a sign of being. And it was also problematic for Rumi himself to tell his experience of nothingness in words that were sign, sign of being, hasti. So there is this paradox at the heart of the, these love poems that they invite us to make an experience of not non-being anymore. But by so doing, they use words that belong to the world of being. And this paradox cannot, of course, be, um, be solved, in fact, except if you stop, if you stop uh, making, composing poetry which they never do because they cannot refrain from, um, from, um, from that. So 
I will skip that and come to the end and to my conclusion because it's half past eight now. And I will not talk about the pearl that Lely is. Um, I just arrived to the end. Just, to, just a, a few words about the, the image of the pearl that I referred to previously, and that is so important in the poetry of Nezami, Jami, but all the others, even in Hafez, you know, he very often alludes to the fact that his poetry is a necklace of pearls that he has done, and you know, what the poet says is, is a production of pearls coming from his mouth, etc. But in Nezami, uh, what is added to the idea that pearls, uh, the pearl is the metaphor of poetry, is that Lely is also connected to a pearl. And she's said to be um, an unpierced pearl. Not only because she's a gem, but also because she remains a virgin till the end. And Nezami, uh, the, not Nezami, oh, in, in all the Persian poetic tradition, you say of poetry that it's well, well pierced pearl. So it shows us that Leili is the pearl, and the poetry is what she becomes after having become an image or an object for the poet. You know, so um, she is that pearl that will be pierced by the power of the words that Nezami, Jami, Hafez, or anybody else uses. And this again connects the desire of union with the desire of saying about that desire. So poetry and the experience of love. It's a little complicated to put it, but, to put it right, but I hope I make myself clear. Um, Leili, as I said, is indeed hidden and Nezami says she's a hidden pearl. So she's not hidden because she's a, she's a poor Muslim woman who cannot go anywhere, but she's hidden as a woman, of course, belonging to an Arab tribe. She's veiled, she's secluded, she's lonely in her tent, but most of all, she's unattainable because she's hidden from the worldly eyes like a pearl in a shell. And Nezami says that explicitly when he says, چون باز شدند سوی خانه شد در صدف شد در صدف آن دور یگانه when they went back home Leili and her family that unique pearl returned into her shell because you know it, you cannot unveil the pearl without some uh, precautions you cannot show the veil veil to uh, the the pearl to anybody that is why you Poetry has a very dangerous status in a way because it unveils the pearl that should remain hidden. Through the complementary of images of tent, veil, and pearl, both Leili and poetry are presented as uniting in their beauty, darkness and light, because she's hidden, but she's also, pearl is, is both water and light. Night and day, mystery and knowledge, desire and initiation, the supreme pearl of love and knowledge, that supreme knowledge, that is the knowledge of the reality of being, uh, so that supreme pearl of love and knowledge is echoed by the shining face of the beloved and is hidden somewhere in the long dark hair of the beloved, metaphor of the night of desire. Leili is indeed a hidden treasure, Ganj. And, you know, uh, the whole work of Nezami is called Panj, Ganj, the five treasures. So Leili is the Ganj within one of the Ganj, a treasure within the, the whole, the ensemble that is the Panj Ganj. She's the hidden Ganj protected, as the tradition goes, by either a snake or a dragon. Leili, the torch among the lovelies, was a pain to herself, but a treasure for the others. On this treasure, a snake was coiled up like a protective bulwark. She lived in her sorrow, like a ruby in the heart of stone, although a priceless pearl she was, like the moon she was in the mouth of a dragon. I will not have time to comment upon this, but it would be quite interesting 
to see that how this image came from China and what the, what are the, the the implications of the image of the dragon or the snake because it's it's not always uh, separable. And again, the treasure she is metaphorically relates to Majnun's poetry and knowledge, also represented as a hidden tre hidden treasure. Ma Nezami says Majnun knew the knowledge hidden having solved, solved the riddles of heaven with beautiful words like golden coins, with verses and poems like bright pearls. Everyone, everyone knows that never could a heedless madman scatter such pearls. Majnun may be mad, but he's supremely wise in his practice of poetry. Thus, in the same way as Leili embodies the archetype of beauty, Majnun's poems embody a higher knowledge found only in the experience of love. This embodiment takes the form of metaphors that are, par excellence, poetic riddles, because they have to remain veiled in a way. So poetry both unveil and veils, unveils and veils all the time. The dynamic of desire stands in the successive evocations of the beloved's beauty as tokens of another reality. The poetic evocations inflame the imagination, filling it with metaphors of the beloved and initiating thus to the nature of love, much more convincingly than the flesh and blood presence of the beloved, which can never be so dynamic. In absence only, desire can be triggered again. Through the burning desire of the ideal beloved, Majnun has been able to empty himself from himself and thus make room for the other. He has traveled through the desert to himself and reached the ocean of love where Leili's pearls, pearl was hidden. The ultimate function of poetry is to initiate the reader to the realities of love, to reflect the beauty of the beloved in the mirror of the heart and thus to dive into the ocean of desire and drink from the fountain of inspiration, the water of eternal life. Thank you.